The message you're about to hear was recorded in January 2009, I believe, right after the Kentucky Anna I storm. I was without power for a little over a week, but I still had it better than some. I was still cleaning up from the mess, though you'll hear me talk about that. Also, some of the stories I'll share about my personal life was when I was still pretty young in the Lord, trying to learn how to be a husband and how to be a Christian. And if so, if I sounded awful immature back then, well, I think I kind of was. But thankfully, God doesn't leave us that way, but he helps us to change. Hope you enjoy today's message. A friend of God. And that's what they, when they were speaking of Abraham. It doesn't say that in Genesis, so to speak, but if you go over to Chronicles, when they refer back to Abraham, they refer back to him as, as the friend of God. Folks, that's just so much what I want to be. But, and I begin to think this morning about what it, what it takes to have that, that intimacy of a relationship. And I remember scripture in the New Testament. Jesus said something very similar to his disciples. In John, the 15th chapter, he said, this is my command. That kind of perks up my ear. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. Whoa. Now, don't that, ain't that high? It'd been, you know, I, I might have felt like I was squeaking by if he just said love one another. <laughs> I wouldn't have had nothing to compare myself to, would I? But he, he went on and he made it a, a, this supernatural, all-encompassing love. He said, love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, that someone should lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you slaves anymore because a slave doesn't know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I've heard from my father. Our relationship with the Lord is a, it's not a stagnant one. It's a, it's a growing one. It changes through times by the choices that we make. Sometimes, for some folks, they never make the one choice that they need to get closer to God. I've seen people come this close to giving their heart to Jesus. But there was something about their life that they wasn't willing to change. In other words, to be his disciples. You are my friends if you do what I command you. It's not exactly when he speaks of friends, he's not speaking of friendship among, among equals. He's the master. Even when he washed their feet there at, at what we call the Last Supper, as he washed their feet, he said, he said, you call me master, he says, you do well. But as I have done, he says, you do to one another. Another example. But it's, a love of a people for their Lord. It's when you love God, folks, it insulates you from so many things. You don't need the approval of people. You don't need success even. You just need to know that what you did is what God wanted you to do. In the Old Testament, I'm reminded of a time that God said, they said, God, should we go to battle? God said, yes, and they went and they lost. <laughs> So they did like I did. They went back to check the message. Hey, God, should we go to the battle? Yes, and they lost. Third time, they really got down to business. And they prayed, and there was a little bit more to the message after this. Yes, for I surely shall deliver them into your hands. Not everything that we do with God is, is uh, rewarded with success. So success or praise of men is something that we're looking for that keeps us on the path that then we'll fall short. As the Bible gives a good reason. Whatsoever you do, do with all your might, not as unto men, but as unto God. And he promised us that we wouldn't so much as give a drink of water to another person in the name of Jesus that we wouldn't be rewarded. It's God that is our rewarder. And someone, I used to, a preacher I used to hear, he said, God doesn't pay on Friday. But payday's coming. 
Nehemiah understood that. When the people spoke evil of him, when he was trying to do the work of God, he prayed and he says, Lord, remember me for the good that I've done. In other words, I've tried to do the right thing, God. And I'm going to leave it into your hands to reward me. But that's still not the reason that we do it. We don't do it for the reward. I think that's one reason that the reward is withheld for a time. One time people followed Jesus, you remember? Because before that he had fed the multitudes with a few fish and a few loaves of bread. And they, they was following him. Jesus turned around and looked at him and says, you're not following me because of what I say. You're following me for the loaves and fishes. They, found, they thought uh, they were freeloading. <laughs> he was passing out food. They thought, you know, this is a lot easier than working for it, I suppose. And so that's why they, hung, they wanted to follow Jesus. He didn't feed them that time. He says, you're following me for the loaves and fishes. You're not following me for what I've got to say. But in Peter's case, when people started to go away from Jesus because of some of the things that he said, Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples and he asked them, point blank, will you leave also? Peter spoke up and he says, Lord, where will we go? You're the one who has the words of life. I think Jesus asked them so they would understand where their heart was because after that, if you read in the book of John, things started to get hard. Not long after that, they begin to plot how to do away with Jesus. Things were going to be dark for a while. That was sort of me as sort of a defining moment for the uh, for the children uh, for Peter and the and the disciples. Will you leave? No, Lord, I will stay. And our relationship with God is like that. There comes a moment that <clears throat> we come to a razor edge, but we're being pushed to make certain choices. And when we make them, <clears throat> when we make the right ones, we don't end up lost in the snowstorm. But we end up on the path that we that we wanted to be on. But it comes down to that to that to that moment of obedience when God asks something of us. When he asked something of us, and we said yes. Marsha and my, we didn't, I just, it took me a while to win Marsha over, okay? I decided a long time before she knew that I loved her. I just, that was the woman I was going to marry. Doesn't that sound a lot like what God has done in our life? Before we even knew him, he decided that we was going to be his. But all along, the st- all along this way, she made some choices. When I first started dating her, uh, she was dating other folks too. Killed me. Because I didn't decide that she was mine and I was, I'm a little selfish when it comes to my darling. And finally one day I looked at her and says, you're, I said, you're either all mine or I'm gone. I don't remember the exact words I used, but that's what I meant. See, either you love me and you know, we're exclusive or you don't, you love me and I'm gone. See, at a moment, things could have been a lot different. No Josh, <laughs> no Dana. Things could have been a lot different. But for some uh, no unknown reason in a moment of weakness, she chose me. See, that was the first step in our relationship, exclusivity. And then that folks, for, for God, he, he said, I will be, he will be our God and there he would have no other. You shall have no other gods before me. There shall be nothing in this world that you love as much as me. Nothing. There's no desire, no wish in your heart that shall be as important to you as me. So decide. Are you mine or you're not? That's what we call the moment of salvation. 
Are you willing to forsake your sins? Acknowledge me as Lord and worship me only. And I know that you're not likely to bow down to a golden idol or any of these other things, but if you've been around preachers enough, you know that an idol is anything that you put before God. That would be home or family or job or recreation, any of those things. Anything that you put before God, that it's more important for me to be here or to do this than it is to do what, I, uh, what God wants. That is your God, and he'll not have it. He'll not have it. If when God starts feeling cold to us, often in my own life, if I'm not careful, I let busyness, if I'm not careful, uh, crowd out the things of God. This week's been extremely hectic since the ice storm. And if you look around a little bit, you could tell why. And, uh, but the other day, I'm thankful to God you can pray while using a chainsaw. <laughs> And you can listen, I got to listen to some good Christian programming when I was fixing some of the electric so I'd have electricity over the other trailer. Because uh, I don't know how you feel, but it's, it's like I miss a meal when, I, when I'm not in the presence of God. And he desires us, and me and Marcia, she had to make that choice to be mine. She had to make the choice to stand up before a group of folks and say, I, I do, I do. <laughs> it's all in how you say it. I do, I do. And in all of our relationship, time and time again, God asks something new and something different of us. And if, if we are his Lord, we say, yea, Lord. If he's not our Lord, it comes to a place to say, ah, you know, Lord, no, this is mine. This is mine. This is the way that I choose to live. This is the choices that I make. This is where I want to go, Lord. How much do you love God? It's the love of God, and sometimes in my married life, has kept me with my wife. From time to time, me and my honey has had uh, periods of stress between us. That's, that's amazing. That never happens between husbands and wives, does it? <laughs> Severe stress. And how can I say this delicately? I'm a man. Someone once said, if mama's not happy, nobody's happy. Uh, I tend to think of uh, Bill Cosby when he's talking about his wife. When things weren't good, uh, you know, uh, when it comes bedtime, instead of her wanting to be intimate, he talked about her wearing burlap and barbed wire. <laughs> Not too many women actually do that, but how many uh, husbands and wives, how often is maybe you slept on the edge of the bed or slept on the couch? Just try not to speak each other. Try to act like you're asleep when they come to bed. That's stressful moments. And... Uh, When my wife is stressed out to me, intimate, being intimate with me is not the, not the chiefest thing on her mind. And I remember one time being really upset with her, and I tell you, I used to take drives when I was angry. And because all these voices, I didn't want, uh, I was part of me wanting to run off, I'm tired of this. Part of me wanting to find another woman that would appreciate all, all this. <laughs> My poor wife, pray for her. I gotta look around every now and then, especially now. One of these days, honey, this vast empire is gonna be yours. <laughs> it's all in how you look at it. But as I was driving one night, I remember praying that I was sexually frustrated as a man. And when you're sexually frustrated, the Bible says that leaves open to the door. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, husbands and wives, your body doesn't belong to yourself. It belongs to the other person. And he says that you're not even to withhold sexual relationships with one another except with consent. 
And that's over a period of time and it's given for one reason, so that you may fast and seek after God. In other words, there comes a time in a husband and wife's life if they're following God, there may come a time that they're totally focused on God. Remember I told you that God comes first. He's not going to have anyone before. And he says that you're to obey this rule, he says, so that uh, Satan won't find an opportunity. And Satan was knocking at my door. And as I was driving, I wasn't, I was driving, I was hearing all the voices that men hear when they're frustrated. But there was one thing that kept me strong when I was angry with my wife. I love God, and I wasn't going to sacrifice that for anything. And I remember thinking, I says, Lord, if my wife never has sex with me ever again, I will be faithful. That may be more about me than you want to know, but that's, that's the truth. And all them voices that was pushing me to sin quiet, it, it was that moment of decision for me. I, though things are in a strain, I'm not saying things didn't get good after that. I'm not saying that. But at that moment in my heart, I said, Lord, you can have it. If, if something, if whatever it takes, I am going to be faithful to you. Being faithful to you means being faithful to my honey. And I don't know how long after that I looked at her one day and I said, you don't have to worry. If I take a drive, I'm not going to, I remember where I belong. And I will never be unfaithful to you. Don't ever worry about that. And I th believe, as I said, my memory gets older. I don't think I ever felt the need to take another drive after that. Not saying that my honey hasn't made me mad and I want to sleep on the edge of the bed <laughs> or not talk to her from time to time. But that come a defining relationship. I made that decision that I can give up this to maintain my relationship with God. I can give this up to keep my relationship with God intact. One time, as long as most people have known me, I've had a beard. I don't know if Josh remembers me without a beard ever. I don't know if in his lifetime I've been clean shaven. But the church that I grew up kind of frowned on beards. Uh, they tend to think of it, I think, because they associated with the hippie movement when I was growing up. You know, the bell bottoms, free love and stuff. And I remember seeking after the Lord, and I, I shaved once because I thought, I love you, Lord, more than my beard. I cut my hair once. My hair used to be pretty long, but I cut it. But they, they taught them, you ain't, guys, you ain't supposed to have long hair. And I cut my hair. I says, God, I, I love you more than my long hair. Not that my hair was pretty, it was. <laughs> but it was part of who I was. Those were defining moments for me. Uh, when I got saved, I didn't like going to Sunday school. It may, you may find that I just really didn't like going to Sunday school. We had church four times a week if I, if I went to Sunday school. Uh, I was still going three times a week. And actually, I used my Sundays. You know what I did with my Sunday? I wrote songs sometimes. I'd meditate on the, read the scriptures. It wasn't like I was home watching football. I wasn't doing that. I just felt I would do things that made me feel go, uh, close to God. Uh, Josh, is, I know, is struggling now with this time thing. And it's difficult when you don't feel like you've got any time. And for me, part of my uh, walk with God is always I wanted revelation from God. And, and part of my music thing was always, whether good or not, it was my way of expressing myself before God. And, uh, but after a while, I got to thinking, maybe I'm not making the, doing the best thing by not going to Sunday school. Well, I didn't really like Sunday school, and I was bored out of my mind when I did go. So, and I was doing something good at home. But I came to a place that I felt like maybe this is something, I don't want to go to Sunday school, Lord, but I will. 
if it, if it helps me to accomplish that which you want me to accomplish, to be that which you want me to be. So I started going to Sunday school. It turned out after a certain amount of time, it's not like I showed up and all of a sudden they let me start teaching, but I was, they put me teaching. And at first it was young adults. And then uh, the gentleman that was teaching the, the, the older adults, he didn't want to uh, do it anymore. And I ended up teaching all the adults. And uh, it's kind of a funny thing because I had one guy in my class, he didn't like the way I teach, so he went to the older adults. He was a younger adult. He just told me he didn't like the way I taught. <laughs> Not the exact words he used, but he said, you didn't preach the Bible. You don't preach the Bible. I said, well, Lord bless you, brother. Go ahead. You know, I'm okay with, I just like it. If God was to bless you all and you wanted to go to another church, I wouldn't be here holding on to your shirt. Say, don't go, to, don't go. I want you to go where God wants you so you'd be happy. Well, I end up, I end up with all the classes he had and end up listening to me anyway. But that was a defining moment for me. It, after, not too long after that, I became, I became a teacher. been teaching a long time. Some of you thinking too long. In my life, I remember what, I used to have, be a comic book fiend. Now, is there anything wrong with comic books? A lot, a lot tamer when I started reading them than they are now. They call them graphic novels for a reason now. But when I was growing up, it was pretty innocent. But I felt like I was spending too much time on something besides God. I could read a comic book 15 times, but it was hard for me to pick up and read one chapter of the Bible. For some of you, it may be easy to flip through the channels or a romance novel or... or uh, Venture, sit at the computer. It may be easier for you to do that than to read one chapter of the Bible. But I, I just quit reading comic books. I said, God, see another moment in my life. God, I love you more than my comics. See, in Abraham's life, there came a place God understood. Abraham, he says, get up out of this country and move to a place I'm going to show you. He got up and went. Abraham, take your son Isaac, your only son, because he had sent away Ishmael, and go to a mountain that I'm going to show you, and there offer your son Isaac as a sacrifice to me. He packed up, believing that God was going to do what God, because see, God had promised him Isaac through Isaac, his seed would be known that he would have a multitude of descendants through Isaac. And the New Testament gives a little insight into what Abraham was thinking. He believed that if God was, a, even if he went as far as to slay his son, which he was ready to do, that God would bring him back to life. That's a lot of faith. Two things going on there. God, I trust you. God, I love you more than anything in my life. I trust you and I love you more than anything in my life. God, you're my priority. It's not that we choose always to do things that are terrible. That shows that maybe we're not in the center of God. Like I told you, I, was, I would sit home on Sundays and I would pray and I'd write music. And I'd read the scriptures, that's what I did. But there come a time that I did something I didn't really want to do because I felt like maybe that my witness would be greater, would, uh, that I would bring more honor to his name if I went to Sunday school whether I liked it or not. So I went. God may be calling upon you to do more, to give more than what you've given before, but if you're not willing to go, take that extra step, then your relationship stops somewhere, short of I do. It's a scripture in the New Testament. It says, husband, loves your, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. He said, I speak of a mystery. He said, I'm, he said in another place, he said, I speak of the mystery of the love of, of 
Christ for his church. It's like that marital love. It's that exclusivity that's willing to give all. When I got married, I didn't have my account and her account. It was ours. I work now. My wife don't work. It's still ours. I never have looked at anything that we had as mine. Now, my wife can't play a guitar, <laughs> and I can't play a piano, but the money that went to buying those things, I just, I just, well, I've saved this money. This is mine. I've earned it. I discussed it with her because everything that we have is ours, and I don't think of my life as separate from her. Any part of my life is separated from her. How I spend my time, where I go, I even discuss it with her. It's, you know, if it's okay with you, I think I'll go over here today. Because she's, we're one. And when if our relationship with God is what it ought to be, then whatever it is that he's wanting from us, we're willing to give. And we don't think of anything as ours anymore. I don't think of this campground as mine. If it's ever going to amount to anything, <laughs> right now I'm thankful it's God. Hey, God, you got a mess. <laughs> Isn't that pretty cool? So I could get a little bit discouraged. I look around, I see a lot of work. I come over here, sometimes I pray with my eyes closed because when I start looking around, I just see stuff needs fixed. It's distracting. I remember a preacher one time, I was listening to him talk, and he said he didn't think of anything of his either. He got robbed one day. And the guy who took his wallet was going to go, and he said, wait, 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 because he had some change in his pocket. <laughs> he didn't get it all. Because he felt like he was stealing from God, not from him. He never thought of it as his. Isn't that a, isn't that a relief? It's like your neighbor's house getting broke into, not yours. And you're always happier than that. You're sad for them, but, you know, <laughs> it was better than the alternative. And we're able to look at everything that we have belongs to God, then that takes a lot of the stress off of it. Because how do you know, how many know that God will take care of what's his? So when you look at your account, you don't think of your money as yours. Uh, I'm probably hard to buy for for Christmas. I'm always thankful just anybody to even think of me, but don't get me wrong. But when I, whenever I'm looking to spend money or to get something, it usually has to do with the ministry. Because that's who I am. That's all I'm wrapped up in. I'm not saying that I do, ever do it well. I'm just saying that's where my heart is anyway. It's that defining moment in our life. Abraham had it with Isaac. The disciples had it when he asked them, will you still follow me? For some of us, he asked me another place. He said, go to church more. But Lord, I'm going three days a week. I work all week. All I'm wanting is this Sunday morning. I can sleep a little later. And when I do get up, God, I'm talking to you. But I felt him get rid of your comics. But Lord, this is just such an innocent diversion. <coughs> Here you go. I gave them away, a bunch of them, and I think I had a few in the house I burnt. I hope they weren't worth a lot of money. <laughs> Can you mark your life that way? Can you find that there's places in your life these mileposts that you've walked past. You know, you may know of God, but as you get more intimate with him, get closer with him, he starts asking things of you. Sometimes it don't even make sense to you what he's asking of you. But all I know is if he wants it, he can have it. Do you begin to think of your time as not yours? This is where I got to be on this day, Lord. This is where I'm always at on this day. This is what I need. We, uh, this is my, this is my me time. <laughs> here, Lord, it's yours. If I never get what I want, Lord, here it's yours. But I have found that as I follow God, and whenever I give something to Him, in exchange, how many thinks that God gives me the short end of the stick? 
See, that's where the trust comes in. See, he's made promises. He says, Jesus Christ said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. (laughs) Don't that sound like a good promise? If I knew nothing else in the scripture about what Jesus came to do, that ought to get me excited. If I could dance, I would. I'm too fat. I'm afraid if I tried, just things would jiggle and if we just would never stop. Jacob in the Old Testament was on the way to face a dangerous time in his life. And he ran into an angel on the bank of a river. And the Bible says he wrestled him all the night long. But after that night, he, was, he received a new name. Maybe you recognize it as Israel. It's because the Bible says your name is Israel. Because as a prince, you have power with God. It was a defining moment. When I grew up, we used to sing a song. I would not be denied. Oh, I would not be denied. Till Jesus came and made me whole. Would not be denied. Talking of, and it used Jacob as an added example. James 2.19 says, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe in this shudder. Isn't it amazing that people that think just because they believe in God, everything's cool? (laughs) I got the news for you. The devil believes in God. The devil's not an atheist. (laughs) The devil is not an atheist. He knows there's a God. Foolish man, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? I think King James uses the word faith without works is dead. Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was active together with his work and by works faith was perfected. When the Bible uses the word perfected, it means completed, you know, like, uh, or come to maturity, you know, like grain. If you used to say grain was perfected, it would come to the point where it was ready to be harvested. It came what it was meant to be. So the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness and he was called God's friend. God it's that faith and works together it's an amazing how many people say that I'm okay I believe in God and they won't go to church how is it amazing the number of us Christians that say I believe in prayer and we don't do it isn't it amazing the ones that say I believe the word of God is true and it's what we need and we don't read it isn't it amazing? The sales of us have said, I want Jesus to be pleased with me, but we won't do the things that it takes for us to be pleasing unto him. Lay aside sin. Make him the priority in our life. Serve no other gods before him and even learn to do without if that's what it takes to walk in the presence of God. I've known preachers that have lost their wives because they wanted to follow God. The person that follows God can put up with loneliness. The person that follows God can put up with uh, uh, celibacy. The person that follows God uh, gives everything that they own to God. They don't think of anything as theirs. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the Bible speaks. And everything that they do Every place that they walk, everything that they own, they say, Lord, this is yours. How can I use it to bring you glory? What is it, Lord, that I could do in my home? What is it, Lord, that I could do with my phone? (laughs) 
Lord, what is it that I can do with my free time? I was blessed the other day. I was watch, I like watching the 700 Club when I get a chance. And uh, they were showing a story about our local area. And some, some guys had taken a vacation to come down here to help people during this ice storm. They were from the Louisiana area. You know, they know what it's like for something bad to happen. They was from a Baptist church down there, and they'd come up here to spend a vacation picking up sticks. What'd you do on your vacation? I went to Disney World. What'd you do on your vacation? I went fishing. What'd you do on your vacation? I picked up sticks. I've known people to take vacation, to go somewhere just to be in church. Most of the time we think it's a vacation when we don't have to have church, don't we? Y'all been on vacation last week. <laughs> the vacation is over. Every church, every individual comes to the defining moment in their life when God asks something of you. And if at that moment that you hold that back, then you're stuck in that spot. There's nothing sadder, folks. God delivered by a mighty hand Israelites from the Egyptians. Mighty work of God. And he had a big plan for them. Land flowing with milk and honey. But they spent 40 years in the wilderness to an entire generation of people passed away because they weren't able to obtain into it because the Bible says because of unbelief. With many of them, the Bible says God was displeased because of the unbelief in the heart. This lack of trust. Every time something went wrong, they thought they knew the answers to what they need. They wanted to go back doing the things the way they used to. And God finally said, you shall not enter into my rest. The book of Hebrew puts it that way. You shall not enter in my rest. Though so you've uh, Paul says, though they drink of the, uh, baptized with the same baptism, and all drink of that rock, which both of them things is a symbol of the Christian life. He said, but many of them, God was not well pleased. And he says, they, they died in the wilderness, never having obtained the promises of God. Are you his? God will never let you settle for less than what he wants to give you for which is himself. He wants you to be like Jesus. And he asks something from you time and time again. And you've got to make that decision at that moment. I like to tell you he's done asking me things. I've been praying lately and I, I, I can see something that I need to do, but I'm saying, oh Lord, this hard. It's against my personality. Some folks say when they're having a hard time doing, speaking up for God, says, oh, well, I'm just a shy person like that. that excuses them. Oh, God says, oh, I understand you're shy. You don't have to do that. Now, God don't work that way. If God has been moving you to witness to someone, then being shy is not an excuse. God has not given you the spirit of fear. That word comes uh, in Timothy, it comes from a Greek word that basically means timid. God has not made you timid. It's given you uh, uh, the spirit of power and of love and of sound mind. Step by step, God asks things. Step by step. Still asking things of me after I've served him all these years. You know why? Because uh, the more you know, the more you know. After you walk with him a while and you think, well, now I'm, I'm good and comfortable where I'm at, God tends to ask a little bit more from you. Now, he doesn't do that to be mean, but he's constantly moving you. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but then we know that when he does appear, we shall be like him. We're moving toward the light, constantly toward the light. Has there been a point in this life Besides this morning, you said, God, I've made you priority today. What you wanted, I, I know that you asked me of something and I gave it to you. It's, are you. Have I recognized you that you are the one that I trust? I believe that you're my hope for happiness. 
And then outside of you, I cannot be happy because you won't let me be happy. And Lord, I'd serve you. I serve you because I love you. I told God one time, I told you I was scared of God. I was. There was a place in my life I was a little bit, God was bigger than me and I wasn't doing what he wanted. <laughs> but I, I'm a stubborn napper. God pray for those two back there. Us nappers don't change much. Huh? Huh? Said, God, I will not serve you out of fear. And <laughs> it's the same guy. I got beat up one time. Wouldn't fight, but wouldn't run. So, yes, I am stubborn. Sometimes it works for me, sometimes against me. But God is pushing you towards something perfection in him and you should be a time in this week should be a time in your life that you could if you stop it should be a quiet time you're feeling God asking something of you and I know it's a struggle to give to him I'm not saying that every time God ever asked me something I just was ready to chuck it over I just I had a struggle with it for a while but I recognize that this would be the end of my growth, end of my spiritual growth, if I just keep holding this back from him. It's just come up in front of me all the time. If, if it's a habit that God wants to give, I don't, I don't preach that smoking will send you to hell. I don't believe that. But I have known a great many people come a place in their life they felt like giving up smoking is something that God wanted them to do. My dad was a smoker and he worked in a place that they gave him free cigarettes. And God had asked him to quit smoking. I remember, I think it was my pastor. I tend to get the faces mixed up, but I remember him wanting, he was trying to get into the center of God's will and he was wanting more of God and he's talking about getting on his knees and praying. And he, he was in the military and, you know, he had his cigarettes. And he said he'd get down and pray and he'd see a little picture of a dancing cigarette up in, <laughs> when he shut his eyes. God was asking that of him. He we ain't getting no further, buddy, until you went over this. And wouldn't it be sad to spend all of our Christian life where we're at right now? Are you satisfied with what, what you've got of God now? I'm not. And I know that constantly means that I've got to be changed in something. Because he's showing me because I don't know everything. But the more I know, the more I know. And he's able to open new vistas to me. Things that I could see and understand that I never understood before. And it doesn't matter what my nature is. God is able to change it. It doesn't matter what my desire is now. God is even able to change it. You give something to God, you find that you receive more in return. The Bible says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that's hidden in a field, which a man finds and he goes and sells all that he has with joy. And he goes and buys that field. Oh, God. Lord, let him just see what I can see, Lord, that there's joy, Lord, but it's going to cost us all that we have. Lord, we just need that. We need that joy, Lord. We need that purpose. We need that constantly moving up. Lord, let me not grow lukewarm in my walk with you. God, let, let your voice not go dim, Lord, when it points out my sin. Lord, let me prioritize you in my life, God. Let me think on you. Let me think on you, God. Let me touch you, Lord, and know Jesus is who you are. God, for the sake of my children, Lord, for the sake of my neighbors, for the sake of my nation, Lord, for the sake of all those that I love, God, let me be the man of God that you want me to be. Let us be the church that you want us to be. 
ask it in the name of Jesus.